begin with uh, Namo Tassa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa. How's everybody? <laughs> Good. <laughs> we have a new uh, member of the group. Hi, Sam. <laughs> Good. Good to see you. Mm. Okay. Smiley faces. Mine getting lighter a little bit? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it's only day two. I gotta give it another couple of days. Maybe. Good. So I saw this uh, picture at some point uh, and it was really interesting. Um, there was this church and they had very, you know, very good intention. And uh, I think it was in the US. They had this big, big sign at the junction, and it was saying, You matter, don't give up. And so that was really, you know, well intentioned. But depending on how you read it, you can also read it, You don't matter, give up. <laughs> and that kind of cracked me up a little bit. Um, and that's the topic of tonight's uh, talk. So it's all a matter of perspective. <laughs> it's all a matter of perspective when we look at the hindrances, most especially. So I think this illustrates quite well what these hindrances do to us. <laughs> so in reality, there's a really good intention. We all want to be happy, right? Somebody doesn't want to be happy here? <laughs> okay, so I think we're all on the same page. And so these hindrances, though, uh, they kind of trick us. They distort our perception. And that's when we start reading things backwards. And that creates a lot of confusion and dukkha in our lives. When we start believing the hindrances, basically. So like Bhante would say, the hindrances are not something to be suppressed. They're not something to be pushed down, locked away. Actually, that is a wrong practice. Hindrances come up because they're there, because that's what the mind is doing. That's what, how the mind is conditioned to be. And these hindrances, these distractions, they are our teachers. So 
a few of you know this already, but uh, I think I want to bring that up to the group and to know that when these distractions arise, whatever they are, they can be anxiety, they can be fear, they can be uh, wanting something, they can be boredom, it can be agitation. It doesn't matter, name it. Uh, it's just because now the mind is calming down and these things are already there, but usually we don't see them. <laughs> and now we get, we get this wonderful opportunity to see them. So when they come up, actually we should be happy. Suprasnaikaranai. <laughs> That I understand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It sounds a lot like a singer, actually, this, this little part. <laughs> hmm. And so it's a lot of it is changing our attitude. And it's amazing how really this awakening, this liberation that the Buddha taught is actually so close. It's just right here. But it's just a matter of changing the, the way that we look at things and to understand right view, basically, wise understanding and understanding things properly. Hindrances are only hindrances. They're not you. Did you ask them to come up? No. Did you say, I haven't feel depressed in a long time. I should do it now. No. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, yeah, I really feel like feeling terrible today. That would be great. <laughs> no, no, nobody does that. The reality is that when these things arise, it's just because it's been conditioned and they arise because we give them that power. But when we know this is not me, this is a hindrance it is only a distraction, then we can actually apply the six R's. We can actually let it go. Release, relax. Obviously, the, the first step was to recognize that, the wisdom part. And then smile, change our attitude towards that hindrance. Completely turn that upside down, turn it around and make it funny. Completely, and then it completely loses its power over you. Uh, and I uh, really like this, uh, another very short poem by uh, Hafiz. He's a 14th century uh, poet, basically. So that was a while ago, but his, uh, his words are really uh, touching uh, upon that very, very nicely. And I take that from Tara Brach, actually. This is uh, not an original from me, but uh, I thought this was a very be beautiful way to look at it. What is the difference between your experience of existence and that of a saint? The saint knows that the spiritual path is a sublime chess game with God and that the beloved has just made such a fantastic move. That the saint is now continually tripping over joy and bursting out in laughter and saying, I surrender, I surrender. Whereas, my dear, I am afraid you still think you have a thousand serious moves. So this is what happens a lot at the beginning of the retreat. The mind is really serious and it really believes in its seriousness. <laughs> but like Bhante would say, and that's a beautiful, such a beautiful way of saying that too. He would say, when you smile, when you laugh, you go from taking a hindrance personal, mm -hmm. taking it very seriously and your mind is really tensed around it. And when you laugh, you go from this is me, this is a problem, this is making me so much suffering to it's only that. <laughs> and then it's not even a problem anymore. But this is just a change in perspective. That's all it is. 
and it's not really hard, but we just need to continually train to turn these things around, not taking it personally, not making a big deal out of it, but seeing just like, hey, this is just a hindrance. I got caught again. <laughs> and then six houring and coming back to the object of meditation. And so to direct us a little bit more closer to the Buddha's own words, tonight I will be reading the simile of the cloth, the analogy of the cloth. It's uh, Majjhima Nikaya uh, 9? 7. And this is a beautiful analogy that the Buddha had uh, to compare a mind that is clean, that is bright, that is pure, and a mind that is literally full of hindrances and uh, a little bit dirty. <laughs> and how to actually do that process of cleaning the mind so that it becomes bright and sparkly and happy. <laughs> so this is at Savati, and the Buddha says, Monks, just as if a piece of cloth were stained and full of dirt, and a dyer would soak it in any kind of dye, whether it was blue or yellow or orange or red, it would look badly dyed and dull in color. Why so? Because of the dirtiness of the cloth. In the same way, monks, when the mind is soiled, a difficult life can be expected. And just as if a piece of cloth were clean and bright and a dyer would soak it in any kind of dye, whether it was blue or yellow or orange or red, it would look well dyed and bright in color. Why so? Because of the cleanliness of the cloth. In the same way, monks, when the mind is clear and bright, a happy life can be expected. And this is, in fact, a question that was asked today is, why, why, why do we do this? <laughs> and that's actually a really good question. Why, why do we do this? Because everybody, want, everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to experience a happy life all the time. Like I asked at the beginning, like who wants to be unhappy here? Nobody. Nobody wants that. And that's completely normal. You're completely normal. That's okay. But do we experience happiness all the time? That's the question. <laughs> now that's when it gets tricky, right? Um, we all want happiness, but how to get it? And how does it work? And the Buddha says, it's all in the mind, literally. So we recite these verses of the Dhammapada every morning. Mano Pubbanga Madhamma Mano Sattha Mano Maya the mind is the forerunner of all states, of all mental states. Mind is their chief. They are all governed by the mind. So a mind that is not well trained, a mind that has a lot of distractions in it, the, the mind that has uh, a lot of hindrances all the time, then it can only be expected that life will be difficult. It, it will be hard. It won't, it won't flow. It won't be very harmonious. Everything will feel like a block. Everything will feel like a, a hindrance, uh, something that is against you all the time. But when the mind is pure, when the mind is bright, the mind becomes the best ally. It becomes, everything becomes easy. Whatever you're doing, and that's what the Buddha is pointing out too here, the Dai. This is all the situations in life, whether it's blue, yellow, orange, or red, whether you're going to work, whether you're at home, whether you're cleaning your bathroom, whether you're on the beach enjoying the sun and the palm trees, or whatever you're doing. 
uh, it's all a matter of the purity of the mind and so whatever you do actually it doesn't matter what you do with your mind that's what really matters if you smile if you radiate metta you're happy here and now and that's just a fact <laughs> anything that pulls you out of that might rub you from your smile might rub you away from love and that's not good that's not fun that's not a fun state to be in and the Buddha says and what are the stains of the mind and I think that's a good question for the audience what do you think the stains of the mind are We touched a little bit upon it yesterday, but this is a, a, a longer, he's got a few, a few of them. Anybody got some ideas? Doubt. Doubt, yes, very good. Restlessness. Restlessness, yes. <coughs> hmm? Sloth and torpor. Sloth and torpor. Sorry, Sindhu, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> sensual desires just wanting things dislike. all the time dislike dislike yes aversion yes okay good clinging to selfish desires is a stain of the mind impatience is a stain of the mind anger is a stain of the mind holding grudges is a stain of the mind pretension is a state a stain of the mind Retaliation is a stain of the mind. Jealousy, selfishness, deceit, dishonesty, obstinacy, arrogance, pride, self-aggrandizement, intoxication, and carelessness are all stains of the mind. Don't worry, there's a lot more. <laughs> I think this is just a, he was just compassionate, he only said uh, 16, but uh, I think there's a few more. Okay. And this is the first step. And what is the first step? The first R? Yeah, yeah. When we know this, then we have the knowledge then we have the we're empowered with the knowledge to know and then the next step is to understand and apply it and this is the power of the four understandings of the Aryas the Four Noble Truths here he says like yesterday when one understands that clinging to selfish desires is a stain of the mind it's actually not for your own good it's not for the good of others not for anyone's good it's just a stain. How good is a stain? <laughs> no good. Then one lets it go. When one understands that impatience is a stain of the mind, then one lets, one lets it go. When one understands that anger is a stain of the mind, then one lets it go. So that's the power. That's the power of wisdom. That's the power of discernment. Once we recognize the tension, the distraction, then we are empowered to let it go, to release, relax, do the alchemy of the mind and bring up a smile. Turn this whole thing around from negative to completely wholesome. Bring up a smile, bring up the metta, your spiritual friend, or wherever you are in the meditation, whether it's in all directions, that comes a bit later then we turn the trash into gold. <laughs> when one understands that pretension, retaliation, jealousy, selfishness, deceit, dishonesty, obstinacy, arrogance, pride, self-aggrandizement, intoxication, carelessness, Boredom, anxiety, agitation, thinking about this and that and worrying about this and that and letting the mind just roam about in the mental pasture, basically. 
All of this comes with tension, and it's not for our own good. But the problem is, <laughs> we really take these things personal. So that's where the, the real root of the problem is. When somebody is anxious, they're not thinking, oh, I'm anxious, I should let it go. They're thinking, well, what am I going to do? And what, uh, who should I call? And how should I deal with this? And should I go back home? And, what, uh, and the mind just keeps on roaming about and doesn't recognize. So this is, this is the problem. We take these things so personally. We get caught up in the story. And we, when we do this, we, we are blind, basically. We are blinded by, and that's why they are called hindrances, <laughs> is because we can't see clearly. It's a distraction. And so whenever, when we practice on retreat, this is exactly what we're practicing. We're practicing to shift our perspective, to see these things, everything, everything that arises, literally everything that arises, that pulls you away from loving kindness, from metta, that pulls, that rips the smile away from your face, that brings your mind down, that is a hindrance. And it's not you. It has nothing to do with you. It's not personal. It's a completely impersonal process. And we'll talk about more uh, about this impersonal process that is called dependent origination. Later on the retreat, we'll see how these conditioned states, we accumulate them in the mind. And when we accumulate them, they just, that's what happens. They come up and we have to deal with them. And this is what we're learning to do here. The first step is to really understand that these things are not you. When, when the mind is anxious, it's just anxiety. It's not your anxious, it's just anxiety. And when you start seeing this like that, then it loses all of its power. And you can actually smile or even laugh like Hafiz was saying, constantly tripping over joy because it sees the mind is crazy. <laughs> it comes up with so many things, so many things that uh, it's, not, it's not really happy right now. It wants to do something else. It's bored. It's been an hour and a half now. What's, what's happening? Oh, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> what else do you want? <laughs> Can you six R that? Can you see the tension just in that? Or doubt? Am I really doing this right? Like, I feel like I'm not, like it's not progressing. Like it's not working. Well, the only thing that's not working is that you're thinking that. <laughs> if you let go, if you see the tension in the, it's not working, I'm doing it wrong, that's actually the hindrance. When you take that away, you let it go, release and relax, smile, there's no more hindrance. Everything is fine. The doubt was the thing that made it wrong. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and this is the Buddha's awakening. The Buddha is giving it to us on a plate. And he's saying, look, these are all unwholesome states. You want to get rid of that. They're not you. That's not you. That's just for some reason because of karma, of your past actions and past uh, living conditions, these things have been implanted in your mind like programs on a computer. But there, there are some programs that are really helpful and there's some malware that you have to just <laughs> wipe off. <laughs> Release, relax, let go, re-smile, and then come back. I think nobody likes to work on something on their computer and then it's just like taking so long. You're just clicking something and it takes five minutes to open up, right? 
So how, how long do you want to tolerate that? It's not fun. And it's the same thing with the mind. When the mind is stuffed full, everything seems like you just, you just go out to like get groceries and it's so complicated. <laughs> but <laughs> there's a way of doing it where it's actually, it's nothing at all. You just go out and you're just like, oh, yeah, that looks good and whatever, I'm just going to take this. Well, I can't do this, but you can. <laughs> um, so it's the same thing, it's the same thing with the mind. And, and once you will start recognizing every single possible unwholesome state that arise, and you will be empowered to let all of this go, and what takes its place? an uplifted mind, a joyful mind, a steady mind, a mind that is clear, a mind that is bright. And when that happens, there is so much joy, so much joy, and we have this wonderful, joyful understanding uh, about the Buddha that arises. And so this is, this is amazing. The Buddha is giving us his knowledge, his wisdom, his awakening, basically on a plate. And then when we practice this more and more, and you will start to see this gradually more and more tomorrow, the day after, then there's an understanding that arises that the Buddha actually was right. And this is what happens. Then one arrives at this joyful understanding about the Buddha. The exalted one is a Narahant perfectly all awakened, endowed with knowledge and conduct, living happily, a knower of the world, unsurpassed guide for those who seek self-mastery, teacher of devas and humans, awakened and blessed. And then there arises the joyful un understanding about the Dhamma, thus the awakened one's teaching is well explained, directly visible, immediate, inviting, leading upwards to be experienced by the wise for oneself. This is all about you. You're doing this. You are empowered to do this. It is sandittiko. You have a hindrance arising, anger arises. You see it. Hey, this is anger. There's tension in the body. Apply the six R's, recognizing, that's the first step, release, relax, calming the tension, coming back to the metta or your object of meditation with a light smile. Immediate. There's no delay. <laughs> you see it here and now, it works. You go from angry to happy. This is what we get. Then one arrives at this joyful understanding about the Sangha, Good is the practice of the Awakened One's Sangha. Straight is the practice of the Awakened One's Sangha. Wise is the practice of the Awakened One's Sangha. Meaningful is the practice of the Awakened One's Sangha. That is the four pairs of people, the eight kinds of persons. The Sangha of the Awakened One is worthy of support, worthy of hospitality, worthy of generosity, and worthy of respect. An unsurpassed field of, field of goodness for the universe. These three understandings of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, they represent, um, basically they are also called the, the factors of stream entry. One who has entered the stream is known to be someone who has uh, unwavering confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, and also the virtue, basically. That's what it means to be a stream enterer. And these are results and also they are things that can be cultivated so it works both ways and they they're all linked together obviously when we start understanding the dhamma then we understand that the buddha was right and then we understand what the sangha is actually practicing because usually people will become sangha basically sangha means the four the four pairs of people the the, the aryas basically it's not necessarily the robed Sangha. Sangha can be anybody that has uh, attained to understanding of the path, basically. That's what it means. So when we have the knowledge of these impurities of the mind and we practice accordingly, then that faith arises because we can see here and now. It's experienceable by the wise 
for oneself. You're seeing it in the front row seat, that it works. Then at that time, one has given up, left behind, released and relaxed, and broke free from these unwholesome states. One knows, I experienced this unwavering confidence in the Buddha. Then one knows and experiences the meaning of the Dhamma, knows and experiences the Dhamma, knows and experiences the natural gladness of Dhamma. This is, Dhamma is the way the mind works. Unwholesome states make us unhappy, unwholesome states make us happy. From that gladness, from seeing that within oneself, from that gladness, joy arises in the mind. From that blissful mind, the body becomes calm. Calm in body, one experiences happiness. With a happy mind comes samadhi. So, does that sound familiar? Good. Then remembering the Dhamma at that time when one has given up, left behind, released and relaxed and broke free from these unwholesome states, one knows, I experience the, this unwavering confidence in the Dhamma. Then one knows and experiences the meaning, knows and experiences the Dhamma here and now knows and experiences the natural gladness of Dhamma. From that gladness, joy arises in the mind. From that blissful mind, the body becomes calm. Calm in body, one experiences happiness. With a, body, with, with a happy mind comes Samadhi. You see, and this is something that comes over and over in the suttas, by the way. Just recollecting how amazing the teaching is, is something that the Buddha taught a lot. Just recollecting the beautiful qualities of the Dhamma, for example, and recollecting uh, this next step, which is seeing how we were in the past, how we were behaving in the past, and how much suffering we were causing ourselves and looking at our minds now and looking back and thinking, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> and so I, I'm skipping over the recollection of the Sangha because you, I think you understand the principle here. But you can also do that with the Sangha. It's, it's, it's all related together. And then somebody can uh, see how they broke free from all these unwholesome states and just because of that there's gladness arising there's joy arising there's calm because of that and then the mind is happy and then it becomes collected if a monk of such virtue such dhamma and such wisdom were to eat the finest hand-picked rice for alms with endless curry and dal, this would not impede him. I guess for monks, food can be pretty much the only source of distraction <laughs> because we can't do anything else. <laughs> so that's why the Buddha is saying that. And also the simile of the cloth is also really connected to our lifestyle because when lay people give us cloth it's white and if it gets dirty before we dye it then it looks bad so it looks like a, we did a bad job <laughs> so we try to keep it clean <laughs> and um, you pro I don't know if you've ever tried to, to dye a, a dirty white cloth but I have and uh, it doesn't look very good <laughs> so just as a cloth which is stained and full of dirt becomes clean and bright with clean water, just as gold becomes clear and bright from a smith's forge, if a monk of such virtue, such dhamma, and such wisdom were to eat the finest hand-picked rice for alms with endless curry and dal, this would not impede him. It wouldn't impede them because they've found something so much better than the happiness of food. So uh, some monks, you know, they, uh, they're still, I mean, it's, it's, it's not just monks, but 
uh, some monks that wouldn't have uh, come to that point of realization, that really direct experience of Dhamma, they might still think, you know, in the morning, like, oh, I'll do my chores and I wonder what's for dinner, you know. <laughs> Whereas someone who has actually experienced this is just like, wow, this is amazing. I'm sweeping. <laughs> not thinking anything else really because the food it doesn't matter it's just it's just food it's just going to nourish the body so you can actually go in meditation and continue blissing out basically that's it okay good so i hope i didn't <laughs> disparage the sangha too much because uh, <laughs> i was talking about monks being hungry but um that's why they say that the Sangha is the unsurpassed field of merit for the world because if you give food, for example, to someone who's um, actually just thinking about food, <laughs> it's not the same level of merit than giving food to someone who actually doesn't, doesn't really care so much. He just wants to go and bliss out on meditation and you know, experience the Dhamma here and now. And, maybe even do m more merits because they know that uh, by doing more merits they'll just be more happy also. And that's why there's this merit, the doing merits culture in Buddhism because people who actually experience the Dhamma, they know that by giving, and that doesn't mean necessarily money, that means like giving of your time, helping someone, helping others, actually it feeds your own happiness and then when you look back you can just see beauty and upliftment and that's just there's no price for that like food doesn't even come close or money or name it it doesn't matter what really matters is just that you look back onto your life and you're thinking like wow this is amazing and just you just want to do it more actually <laughs> So this is how it works and then it just gets better and better. So it's this culture of making merit is actually such a wonderful thing in this teaching. And when you give, when you help others, it comes back to you. You might not have a lot of things, but what you have you give and you help. And then you actually don't have much to lose also. <laughs> and that is a very big gain. Whereas some people, we were just talking about uh, like a building and things like that, the construction work and like thinking about money. And uh, you know, there's two ways you can do this. You can either, you know, think about you're actually doing this for a really good cause. You're like you're building a Dhamma hall for people to meditate. And that's just like, there's no price for that. It's just amazing. Or you can think about money and you can think like, I'm going to make a buck out of this. And then you become really unhappy. <laughs> but if you take the path of virtue and generosity and putting in your time, putting in your, your energy, actually it's in fact benefiting you in the first place. And also you get to do and help for others. So it's, it's actually not only just beneficial for others, but actually for you in the first place. Good. And I love this sutta because it's really close to the six R's when you understand it properly. At the beginning, there's a really big elaboration on the hindrances, like these 16, <laughs> just to name a few. And then uh, that's the recognizing step. But we just really break it down. That's right view, samma ditti, what I call wise understanding. And we just, we just need that information first so that we can actually apply it after. And then we let go of the hindrances. That's releasing and relaxing. And now what happens? He's talking about the Brahma Viharas. So he's going right into, he talked about the joy, which also means bringing up the smile, developing that joy. You know, you've seen all these hindrances, they're slowly wearing away and your mind is getting buoyant and uplifted. And now you're directly seeing this and you take it one step further and start practicing the metta, returning to the metta. So we have all the steps of the six R's here, just in the bigger elaboration. Good. That was my word of the day, kushi. <laughs> My new word of the day. So one meditates 
with, the, with a heart filled with boundless love, suffusing one direction, a second, a third, and a fourth. And for those of you who are practicing with the spiritual friend, this is part of this. It's not that far away. Don't worry. Above, below, and everywhere across, to all living beings in this boundless universe, one meditates with a heart filled with love, vast, expansive, measureless, free from anger and impatience, there and then. One meditates further, further in the meditation, as we calm the mind with the six R's, the meditation will change, and we'll start to talk about these steps that arise. When the mind calms down, the metta becomes a little too coarse. We don't want to force the metta. It's actually normal that it will become softer, lighter, more steady. So, and these we will talk about on interviews. We'll keep a steady uh, um, methodology or checkpoints. <laughs> Then as we six are with the metta, and that takes a while, it takes a few days, it doesn't, when the Buddha says that, you know, it doesn't mean that it's just happening in one finger snap like that. <laughs> We're reading it, but he's just explaining. And so as we calm down, and then the meditation changes too. One meditates with a heart filled with boundless compassion, suffusing one direction, a second, a third, and a fourth above, below, and everywhere across, to all living beings in this boundless universe. One meditates with a heart filled with boundless compassion, vast, expansive, measureless, free from anger and impatience. One meditates with a heart filled with boundless joy, with a heart filled with boundless calm. This is what I call upekka. When, when I speak of the Brahma Viharas, I usually call upeka uh, boundless calm, just so you know. Uh, for me, it makes more sense in my own understanding. So this would be equanimity. Good. And then one understands there is this, there is the base, there is the sublime, and there is a release beyond this whole field of conceptual thinking. Now, this is pretty deep. <laughs> uh, maybe we can unpack this a little bit, but um, what do you think these four lines stand for? What, the, what is the Buddha talking about here? What comes in the set of four? <laughs> There's this. Hmm? I heard something. And then there's the base. There's the what is not so good. And then there's the sublime. And then there is a release beyond all of this. Yes, that's, that's part of the answer. Yes. But this, this is pointing to the Four Noble Truths, basically. There is this. We just talked a whole exposition on the hindrances earlier, the stains of the mind. There's this. There's the base, that's craving. That's the origin of all of these stains is basically tanha, like discontent, like never being okay <laughs> with just now, what is here. So this is thirsting always for something. And you know, aversion is, is in the same is in the same game. It's like there's wanting and then there's wanting not. <laughs> but it has wanting in it. So whether it's wanting something or not wanting something, it has wanting in it. So it's not being okay here and now. And then there's the sublime, and that is the release. That is uh, experiencing basically the six R's. Now this is where the, begin, the beginning of the practice, where the practice begins. And the last one, there is a release beyond this whole field of conceptual thinking. He's, of course, relating to uh, probably the deeper jhanas, where we even let go of the mind. But also he's pointing out to the path also. So there is a gradual training that 
Even in the second jhana, there's no more vitaka vichara, for example. So this is also conceptualization, conceptual thinking. But the whole path is how to see mind, how mind works, and how it arises, and how to let go and purify it. And so it's interesting, he's always using this pattern, the pattern of the Four Noble Truths. And this is really important to understand. This is the core of the path. It's, it's welded with right effort, wise practice. They're inseparable, inseparable, basically. And once we learn to apply this template all the time, we see the hindrances, we recognize, and it's the six R's. The six R's are nothing but the Four Noble Truths and Right Effort put together, basically. So it's like, um, sometimes we think, uh, well, it's not in the suttas. Well, actually, <laughs> it's just made simple, basically, so that we can actually have something to chew on, to something that is really simple here and now we can use. Uh, but there's so many ways of explaining it. This whole sutta is actually explaining this. And so if you uh, ever have come upon this formula of right effort, there's actually two, two differences, two, um, two levels in right effort. There is, of course, the protecting uh, from unwholesome states to arise, then abandoning unwholesome states, then uh, bringing up wholesome states, and then maintaining, right? This is right effort. But if you read the Vibhanga Sutta or the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, there is an explanation of the path and in there there is an explanation of right effort. And it's not only these four things and it, it's doing each of them continuously, relentlessly. And that doesn't mean like sitting with <laughs> frowning your eyebrows and going like really trying hard to meditate. That's not what he means. <laughs> But it's something that came up a, a lot today on interview was doing this continuously. You know, so some people ask today, actually a few, a few people ask today, so what do I do when I like, don't meditate? Well, actually, <laughs> meditation is all the time here. <laughs> Whether you're standing up from your seat, you're not stopping meditation. You're still having the loving kindness. You're still maintaining that object. If you're not, then you're, you're, you're not actually doing your job. You, you have, here you have people cooking for you, you have, uh, everything is set up so you don't have to think about anything. Or hopefully, we're hoping that you don't. <laughs> and we're hoping that everything is set for you to not have anything to worry about. And you have all of this time to do your job, right effort, the six R's. And that's your job here. That's the only thing you have to do, is bring up the metta, whether it's your spiritual friend, whether it's in the six directions, whether it goes up uh, into the deeper advanced practice, then you stay with that. Anything that pulls you out of this, six hours. And that is the only job. The only thing you have to do here is just that. You're not getting paid, but you are getting paid at the same time. <laughs> Depending on, it's a production paid here. So the more you do it, the more you get paid. <laughs> so whether you're picking up a glass of water, picking up with love. When you stand up from your seat, stand up with love. When you walk to the dining hall, walk with love. When you go to the bathroom, Go to the bathroom with love. When you take a shower, take a shower with love. When you go outside walking meditation, go do some walking meditation with love. When you sit down, same thing, sit down with love. If you meet someone, meet them, greet them with love. Don't talk though. <laughs> <laughs> And the more you find excuses to do that, to love everything, even your cell door or whatever it is, 
then you you will stay with that feeling all the time it will be really easy find find excuses to love all the time so it's not only the first steps of right effort that we saw of uh, protecting abandoning then uh, arising wholesome states and then maintaining those but it's doing those continuously all the time and so usually the buddha will frame his discourses around that he'll talk about the four noble truths in the way that we just saw it, he doesn't say it's the four noble truths but that's what he means it's always revolving into that sariputta said of all the teachings the four noble truths is like uh, the, the footprint of an elephant is that the biggest animal out there. All the other animals' footprints fit in the Four Noble Truths. You can always find the Four Noble Truths in the Buddha's teachings. I don't believe there's not a Hindi word for elephant. <laughs> Hati. Yes, same like a Pali. Good, good. <laughs> Good, good. Mm. And so here, it's usually the pattern. He'll start with the Four Noble Truths. Then the first kind of level of right effort, he'll, tell, he'll say like, okay, so you do this, you abandon those, and then you develop these. And then you do that continuously. That's the second kind of level to right effort. And you see that also in the, the Seven Supports of Awakening. You have mindfulness at first. Then you have investigation. Investigation is like the first level of right effort. And then you have energy. It's like doing this continuously, continuously, continuously. So energy and investigation, these are right effort, basically, in the seven supports of awakening. So, how's everybody feeling? <laughs> I think it's getting late. Mm -hmm. I, had, um, I was talking with uh, Doug Craft uh, over email uh, yesterday and the day before. Um, I asked him if I could actually borrow uh, one of the papers he's reading in one of his discourse on retreat that I really love and it's uh, this lady who actually was taking a walk in the Colorado and uh, there was this um, sign for what to do when you see a bear because uh, she liked hi hiking with her husband in the wilderness and um, uh, she actually thought it was really good if you replace the word bear for thought. <laughs> and it gave very good indications on how to meditate. And I thought I would offer this to you tonight. And it's, it's quite short, but I'm not sure. I just want to take the pulse of everybody. If, is, is this something that you would like? It's not going to be very long. And I like to end on a light note so that, you know, it's, uh, it's fun and it's... Uh, it's actually really good and it's quite funny. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so, uh, obviously I'm taking this from Dog. And uh, for those of you who don't know him, he's an amazing uh, twim teacher. He has uh, this kind of a movement that he calls easing awake. Um, and so I'm very fond of the way that he teaches. And um, many merits to him, he allowed us to be able to read this tonight. And this is from actually another of his friend, I believe, so it's not, uh, so he just told me that it's not an original thing. <laughs> so meditation hints from the Colorado Division of Wildlife. <laughs> okay, okay. So this is uh, by Kim Boykin, and uh, this is, right, she writes a very short introduction to explain what the situation is. So, my, hus my husband and I spent the last summer at my family's cabin in Grand Lake, Colorado, at the edge of the Rocky Mountain National Park. In town one day, I picked up a pamphlet on living in bear country, and the suggestions for what to do when you meet a bear sounded a lot like meditation instructions. <laughs> Substituting thought for bear, here are, some help, here are some helpful hints from the Colorado Division of Wildlife. So here we are. Colorado has been home to thoughts since the earliest ancestors evolved in, the North, in North America. 
So I'm sorry if I, I laugh a little bit because I just think it's just so funny. <laughs> Today, increasing numbers of people routinely live and play in thought country. Learning about thoughts and being aware of their habits will help you fully appreciate these unique animals and the habitat in which they live. So what to do if you meet a thought? There are no definite rules about what to do if you meet a thought. Thought attacks are rare compared to the number of close encounters. <laughs> However, if you do meet a thought before it has time to leave the area, here are some suggestions. Remember, every situation is different with respect to the thought, the terrain, the people, and their activity. First, stay calm. If you see a thought and it hasn't seen you, calmly leave the area. <laughs> Second, stop. Back away slowly while facing the thought. Give the thought plenty of room to escape. Wild thoughts rarely attack people unless they feel threatened or provoked. Speak softly. This may reassure the thought that no harm is meant to it. If a thought stands up upright or moves closer, it may be trying to detect smells in the air. This isn't a sign of aggression. Once a thought identifies you, it may leave the area or try to intimidate you by bluff charging to within a few feet before it withdraws. Don't run or make any sudden movements. Running is likely to prompt the thought to give a chase and you can't outrun a thought. <laughs> And if you have a potentially life-threatening situation with a thought, or if an injury occurs, please contact the Division of Wildlife, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Share this with a friend or a neighbor. <laughs> so on this, I will not keep you longer. I, I guess I, I always forget about the questions and answer, but... Uh, do you have any questions? And please feel free when I talk, uh, even while during uh, <coughs> giving the talk, please feel free to, to ask any questions. It's not, uh, it's not just a monologue up here, so. <laughs> oh. So I think we have one. Good. We have a thought. I have a thought, yes. Good. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, so, when you, when you talk about mind and uh, it, what I understand I'm just uh, learning to distinguish with awareness of what the mind does. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a question. I, I mean, this is what I'm understanding uh, as it goes. And metta is the vehicle or the tool or the access. Yes, it's a conduit, it's a medium, right. mm -hmm. it's a skillful mean. Mm -hmm. So the, the mind itself, which is compulsive in nature and mm -hmm. not really in my control, mm -hmm. 
control. Um, Meta is on the using the Brahma Brahmas is um, a way to not feed the mind and it's okay. Yes. So it, that's how it tends to um, lose steam, I suppose. Or that, and that's what we would call as the purification or the, the wholesome state. Yes. We need to give the mind something to do first. <laughs> something wholesome. There's more to it, but yeah, if no, I just stay there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I just wanted to clarify this myself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Question. Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> so we're basically um, learning how to l let go of the OCD nature of mind here, basically, the obsessive compulsive <laughs> disorder <laughs> mind. <laughs> obsessing about all kinds of things, whether it's wanting something or not wanting something. Because that, that kind of mind doesn't experience peace, and doesn't experience happiness, and it doesn't know what it really actually feels. My first uh, meditation 10-day retreat, th that was like the, the, the biggest realization, was like, oh wow, like that exists? <laughs> not even knowing that it exists before, it's just trying to get a hold of happiness in any way, like floating down a raging river and you just like hold a log and you're like, wow, I'm like, this is, this is good, this is good, but it's not really good <laughs> until you actually get to the shore. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. efficiently because mind doesn't have uh, so many hindrances it's been purified it's actually a good practice to sometimes spend some time with the metta even though we we've gone through all of the stages and in, in everything in the daily life for example to develop further the metta is actually very uh, very helpful that will create, a, it's like a, making the foundation even wider and even bigger for everything uh, uh, that is further up to be built and be very stable. <laughs> Does that kind of answers? <laughs> okay. Well, it's, it, the thing is that the, the, the mind that has experienced the deeper levels of release usually won't be won't be interested in going back down to the metta. I think that might be a thing that happens. But technically, it's much more purified, so it would be much more efficient at doing the metta afterwards. But not necessarily interested in the activity of it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Some people practice only on full moon. Oh. Full moon. Yes. I think six o'clock to ten o'clock. Yes. Uh, there is a benefit to us also. 
this full full moon thing is uh, it's simply because at the time of the Buddha and still today uh, th these were time measures so um, basically that's how they they knew when to gather basically in the monastic community we have uposata uposata observance is literally every new moon and every full moon and that's the reason for that is not esoteric unfortunately <laughs> it's really practical <laughs> so when you see that there's a full moon in the sky it's e it's somewhat easy to see it's it's full and there's ways that you can tell that too it's kind of part of the monastic training we have to know these things because we have to be able to tell when the uposata is now we have calendars and like uh, eye calendars and google calendars and all this but that wasn't in place uh, at that time so these moon were these these time references with the moon were only to uh, to basically to help us gather uh, once every two weeks although now in the lay community it's basically in, in Sri Lanka for example it's it's poya it's called poya every week uh, every uh, quarter of the moon basically so every quarter of the moon and in Sri Lanka they they love the Buddha Dhamma so much uh, that um, it's a national holiday <laughs> every Poya day so they get an extra an extra holiday <laughs> in their week unless it falls onto a Saturday or a Sunday so basically in the in the lay community of Upasaka and Upasika um, people will go to the monastery usually once a week on either a, a new moon, a quarter moon, or a full moon, once, it's basically once a week, literally. And then uh, they will take, renew their sila, renew their precepts, take their refuges again, and they will help at the monastery, do some uh, seva, uh, practice their generosity, and then meditation. So it covers the whole thing. So in Buddhist countries, this is, you know, this is the normal, basically, every week, basically every quarter moon, lay people will go to the monastery and practice. So that's, I think, what you were talking about. It's a common in this country, we uh, as it follows like every month, every week, uh, normal uh, monastery, we help our precepts, uh, precepts, our meditation country. We normally in Buddhist countries, we Good. Okay. Very good. Is it time to share merits? Okay. Okay. So. But yes. Buddhism. Indian Buddhism. Is uh, Buddhism. Yes, sorry? Pachimakya Buddhism. Or Indian Buddhism. Is my cap or Sanskrit question is uh, what is the difference between Indian Buddhism and uh, other countries? Western. 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 Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hmm. It's a very good question. I guess it, it changed a lot, so it's 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 a bit tricky to answer. But hmm. in the West, because of the cultural background, uh, the culture has developed a very scientific mind. So because. Unfortunately, some religions that I, I will not name uh, have been used to control and manipulate the people. Uh, and so, unfortunately, people, a lot of people in the West have been really fed up with religion. They don't want to know anything about religion because it was basically a way to control people and ask money. And uh, basically, they, they had supremacy over everything. In Canada, there's uh, very big scandals happening right now. They're discovering 
very sad things that were done. I'm not going to go into this. It's not really nice. But yeah, so and there was a lot of disgusting things that were done in the name of religion. And so in the West, people have just said no more of this, basically. We just. And now the rel religion, I, I have a hard time calling Buddhism a religion, personally. Um, religion comes from the word religar in Latin, which means to bind. Uh, I think the Buddhist teaching is all the opposite. So, <laughs> uh, so I have a real hard time with that word. But I, I actually see it as a science of liberation, basically. That's how I, I see it the most accurately. I think there's beautiful things to take from the Western understanding, but it's also lacking in many things, which actually Asia is strong in. And so for me, I, I really love to see the cooperation in between the two. I, I, love, I think it's really beneficial for both to, uh, to learn from each other. Uh, I think uh, here in Asia, in India more specifically, but I mean, I came from Sri Lanka and so much faith, so much, you know, and it's, it's just so clear to people here and it's kind of un, un, uh, destabilizing sometimes for Westerners that are not used to like such devotion and such like uh, um, quick understanding. Like I see a lot of people like hungry for Dhamma here kind of thing. Where in, in the West, it's slowly going, but it's different. It's a different approach. You can't, you can't actually just like try to evangelize Buddhism in, in the West because it just doesn't work. <laughs> it's actually turning people around. It's just like, no, um, they've, it's been tried too many times now. <laughs> but in the West, people are starting to really like Buddhism because it's, it's a, the science of the mind, basically. And everything is uh, very, like the Buddha was like this mental, he, he was the surgeon, basically. That's how he called him, himself, uh, Salako, like the mental surgeon, basically, removing the dart of craving. And everything he says is very scientific and it's very clear. And there's not much, there's no blind belief involved. And so slowly, uh, it's starting to pick up in the West. Yeah, and uh, although I think we need, for me anyways, that's what I, I see is we also need uh, the Eastern uh, outlook uh, because first that's where it came from and this is where, uh, you know, in, in countries like India and Sri Lanka, uh, I haven't been to all the Buddhist countries but I hear it's, it's quite similar. Um, these are the countries where it's actually possible to, f for us monks to live as bhikkhus. Like, it's, it's possible. Like, I can go out with my bowl and probably get fed. <laughs> Whereas in the West, <laughs> it's another... Uh, I have good stories about that. Maybe we can talk about that later. But I spent two years by myself in Canada going for alms and... Uh, literally surviving <laughs> and going for alms in, in town and uh, people approaching me and uh, saying like, uh, oh, you brought your drum. <laughs> so um, that was interesting. And it's like, oh, oh, you brought your singing bowl or something. Like, are you going to like play your singing bowl tonight somewhere? Or like, uh, I was like, no, actually it's, uh, and we can't really, we can't really ask for anything. So it's really uh, kind of, and then people think I'm wearing a costume and uh, yeah, just like, love your costume, bro. <laughs> so I got that a lot. And a lot of things I won't even, I won't even say. I mean, it's, it's, it's been quite interesting. So yeah, so I think the Eastern, like um, for me, I'm so, I'm so grateful that it's still here, that it's still possible even though it's changed. Like, I'm so happy and impressed that there's still that possibility here. Because, I mean, if it wasn't there, the Buddhist teaching wouldn't be. So, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> Good. Sorry. <laughs>
Oh, the Sam knows about the guard dogs. Maybe we can ask Sam. <laughs> Do you know about the guard dogs? So at night there is guard dogs. And so you can't walk around. Uh, I think. Oh, 10 to 12. Oh, I just learned that too. That's great. <laughs> Good. I knew there was guard dogs. So I just didn't go out. 10 to 12. Okay. Yes. <laughs> if we what? Sorry? Replace guard dogs with thoughts. With thoughts. Yes, yes, yes. How to uh, manage to guard thoughts. <laughs> this is pretty similar, I think. I think it was uh, Rupesh who said that there's bears sometimes here too. So, yeah. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> mm, good. Yes. Panthers. Panthers. Ooh. <laughs> Listen, I saw there's a tiger reserve also. I was actually going to change up the word bear for, well, for tigers or something. Because here it's like more like, yeah, we got tigers, you know. <laughs> like, it's really okay. <laughs> Welcome to India. <laughs> mm, good. That's awesome. No more questions. Okay. Let's share merits. Okay. Dukkha patta jani dukkha bhaya patta jani bhaya soka patta jani soka hontu sabbe pipani no Irano punyan sabbe satta anamorandu sabba sampatti siddhiya aga satta ja bhumatta devanaga maidika punyan tanga numoditva chirang rakantu sambuddha sasana May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they all protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad, sad. Thank you and have a good night. Apetayam chakumaikaraja Avisavano pata vipabhaso Tang tang namasami harisavano pata vipabhasam Dayanja gudda Come on.